Previously on The Secret Life of Death, Episode 4, Langmaid, Part 1, we were introduced to the story of the 1875 murder of 17-year-old Josie Langmaid in Pembroke, New Hampshire. Her body had been found less than a quarter mile from her school, brutally assaulted and mutilated. The town called in experts from Boston to investigate the crime, and just days after Josie was found murdered, they thought they had found the perfect suspect in William Drew, a poor man who lived near the Langmaids. But when the eyewitness that identified Drew later recanted her assertions under oath, Drew and his supposed accomplice, Charles Moody, had to be released. Having cleared all the other convenient suspects, the only black man in town and a number of vagrants, investigators had to start over. And people in town were becoming more and more worried with each passing day that a truly crazed killer was still wandering quietly amongst them. I'm Gail Golick, and this is The Secret Life of Death, Episode 4, Langmaid, Part 2. A reminder, just as in Part 1 of Episode 4, Part 2 contains descriptions of assault, sexual violence, and murder, and may not be appropriate for all listeners. Parts 3 and 4 of Episode 4 put us past those topics, so please, come back for the rest of the story. To the citizens of Pembroke, it must have seemed as though the world had gone insane. In the span of only four or five days, Josie had been murdered, detectives from Boston had arrived, and no less than six people had been arrested for the murder. The flurry of activity, agitation, and outside attention only heightened the sense of unreality. Pembroke had always been a quiet, prosperous town, one that balanced tradition and progress in the same way that many other towns in New England had or very much wanted to. But as events continued to unfold, and the details of how this crime came to be were made known, many citizens turned inward and xenophobic, questioning whether the very things that were once part of Pembroke's pride, the progress that the mills and the railroads and the telegraph signified, were really worth all the bad things they appeared to bring with them. On October 8th, the Selectmen of Pembroke received a telegram from the Selectmen of St. Albans, Vermont, a town 190 miles northwest near the Canadian border. St. Albans officials had read of the murder in Pembroke as it circulated through the region and wired to report that a little more than a year prior, in July of 1874, their town was the scene of a very similar murder and the man they believed to be responsible, Joseph LePage, was now living in Suncook, New Hampshire. At the time, St. Albans, Vermont, and Pembroke, New Hampshire were towns of a very similar ilk. They had a primarily rural, agricultural layout, with downtowns and villages near water power that harbored their modern industrial development, serviced by the railroad. They both had brickyards, which required enormous amounts of cordwood to heat the kilns, which in turn required a workforce to cut that wood, work primarily done by French-Canadian immigrants. And just a little warning going forward. You're about to hear me speak French. I don't speak French. But... I thought, for the sake of historical and cultural continuity, that I would try to pronounce the Quebecois people and place names as they would have, all with the exception of Joseph LePage. He is most well known by the anglicized pronunciation of his name, and so that one will carry through. Just to recap, I don't speak French. Joseph LePage was one of those cordwood cutters, both in St. Albans and in Pembroke. 
Records indicate he arrived in St. Albans from Sainte Beatrix, Quebec, sometime after 1871, and settled in with his wife Eulalie and several of their children in a section of town known as the French Settlement with other Quebecois immigrants. And in July of 1874, a young schoolteacher, Marietta Ball, was on her way home from work when she went missing. Her schoolhouse was in a rural part of town, near the eastern side of the French settlement. She was later found to have been hit in the head with a club, dragged into the woods, raped, and murdered. No mention was made of her further being mutilated, but a homemade mask made of a carpet remnant was found on the scene. The details don't say specifically why LePage was suspected, other than from a New York Times article dated March 16, 1878, which stated that, eventually, clues led to the French settlement in St. Albans, where LePage was then living. His reputation as cruel and a lech led him to becoming a suspect. People in the French community gave him an alibi of burying on the day in question. He was arrested, but released due to lack of evidence. Unsurprisingly, LePage and his family soon left St. Albans and next show up in Suncook Village, where he found himself another job as a woodcutter and settled down among the large French-speaking community there. This had become part of a pattern for LePage, and patterns, as we have come to understand, are integral to the function of sexual offenders and serial killers. Because just prior to his arrival in St. Albans, Vermont, LePage had up and left Saint-Béatrix, Quebec, in 1871, where he had been arrested and was awaiting trial for the rape of his sister-in-law, Juliana Rousse. Juliana would testify in LePage's first trial as to the details of her attack. In circumstances that would mirror patterns in the Ball and Langmaid murders, LePage had approached Juliana out in a field when she was alone, hit her in the head with a club, and raped her. Juliana testified he had been wearing a mask at the time he approached her, and remains of a mask were found at the Marietta Ball murder scene. He had choked Juliana unconscious, though it's not clear he intended to kill her. But something else we know about serial sexual offenders is that their crimes escalate in severity over time. Someone doesn't wake up one morning and out of the blue decide to stalk, abduct, rape, murder, and mutilate. Assuming LePage was responsible for all three attacks, that trajectory holds. Detectives and local authorities soon track down LePage in Suncook, New Hampshire. With the aid of an interpreter, he was questioned as to his activities and whereabouts on the day of the murder. He provided an alibi and claimed he was nowhere near the crime scene, but did say he had been lost in the woods for a good portion of that day. Officials then set out to confirm his alibi and began with those from the Quebecois community where LePage lived and worked. His employer was a man by the name of Joseph Daignon, a Quebec expat who had lived in the States for 20 years, most of them in Suncook. He ran a business in town that, among other things, supplied cordwood needed to run the kilns in the brickyard. All that labor was done by hand in those days. Trees felled by a two-man crosscut saw, cut up with axes, all loaded and stacked by hand. It's what's considered today to be unskilled labor, and was generally performed by the newly immigrated, looking for any means to support themselves and their families. The immigrant communities that sprung up around these manual labor industries got the reputation among the locals for being too insular. And they were. But really, that would be true of anyone new to a foreign country. Add to that the language barrier, and the Quebecois naturally settled themselves among things that were familiar and shared, 
if only to establish a little comfort and continuity until they became settled in their new country. But there were also external forces that tightened that insularity among the Québécois. The very communities and industries they moved here to serve tolerated them with a wary eye. To them, the Québécois would always be the other. The communities these immigrants supported, the ones that depended on the labor of the Québécois to create their wealth, strangely loathed them for it. So it was no wonder that when authorities went to discuss LePage's alibi with his employer, Joseph Daignan, that he was less than cooperative. To Daignan and the rest of the French-speaking community, to have a Québécois accused was just a formality, in the same way all the other minorities had been singled out. In fact, they probably thought it was just a matter of time before the police came calling. Daignan supported LePage's alibi that LePage had been around his shop in the morning and the afternoon, and that he couldn't possibly have been at those places at those times and still made it to the area where the crime occurred. During the trial, the defense brought seven more co-workers of LePage's who testified likewise, accounting for his whereabouts for most of the day. But there were others for the prosecution, who claimed that LePage was scheduled to be working in a woodlot not far from the crime scene, And some said they even saw him on a side road less than a quarter mile from the crime scene that very morning. The authorities were not persuaded by the confirmation of LePage's alibi by his employer and co-workers. And though they were undoubtedly harboring some pretty blatant prejudices towards the groups they took into custody, the fact that LePage just happened to be suspected in an uncannily similar crime just months before could not be discounted. Not even today. And then, there were those strange parts of LePage's alibi. The part no one else could confirm. That he spent a good portion of the day lost in the woods. That was suspicious in itself. A warrant was issued to search LePage's residence, and a knife and several pieces of clothing with what appeared to be blood on them and a pair of LePage's boots were taken in as evidence. the state pulled out all the stops for their scientific analysis, hoping to make a connection between the suspected blood on LePage's clothing and Josie. And though this case proves to be a fascinating study in the burgeoning field of forensic crime scene investigation, it was very much in its infancy as far as what their scientific analysis could actually tell them. Doctors Horace Chase and Joshua Treadwell were the blood analysis experts brought in from Boston. They testified that the clothing samples from LePage that they were given by investigators did indeed have blood present. They described for the jury the process by which they recovered the blood samples from the clothing, by soaking the suspected blood stains in a solution that rehydrated the dried blood and allowed it to be pulled off of the clothing. They then looked at the now liquefied blood samples under a high-powered microscope. This was cutting-edge technology, given that medical science was only just beginning to study the chemistry and composition of bodily fluids and their use as a diagnostic tool for illness. Hospitals didn't even have labs at the time, let alone microscopes. Within the samples recovered from LePage's clothing, Doctors Chase and Treadwell identified what they called corpuscles, as cells with a distinctive biconcave shape, which today we would refer to as red blood cells. The doctors then measured the size of these red blood cells under the microscope and determined that they fit within the known range of sizes for mammalian red blood cells, and were in fact most likely human. The prosecution also entered into evidence more testimony from Dr. Larrabee, the physician who conducted the post-mortem on Josie. He made a comparison of his drawing of the bruise from Josie's cheek, supposedly in the shape of the heel of a boot and the distinctive pattern of nail holes. A pair of boots were taken from LePage during the search by investigators, and Dr. Larrabee said 
when he compared his drawing to the heel of LePage's boot, all the nail holes lined up exactly. Now really, how likely is it that they were looking at human blood? I asked a good friend, Adam Gearhart, who worked for years processing dried blood samples for medical analysis at the New York State Department of Health, what he thought of the processes and results that were brought into evidence in this case. It was pretty neat to see how precise they were relating the size of 2,500 of an inch and how that was like close to a chicken. He said it certainly sounds like they were dealing with actual blood, based on the fact that they were able to identify the distinctive red blood cells for one. You would definitely be able to see um, the red blood cells. White blood cells, the red blood cells would stand out, and yeah, that would be pretty identifiable. And that they also mentioned doing a crystal test. So that is the hemochromin crystal test, is the full name of it. And really all it's doing is adding a particular acid to the sample that that you believe to be blood. And if it is blood, you put it uh, under a microscope, and that acid would have reacted with the blood material and formed a crystal. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that it proved positive um, that it was indeed blood and not just some other red paint or anything. Whatever it's reacting with is forming a crystal because it has the blood components to it. However, he thought back in 1875, the doctors would have had a hard time distinguishing one mammal from another just based on the size and shape of the red blood cells, and they certainly wouldn't have been able to tell whose blood it was, Josie's, LePage's, or a farm animal. These are clothes of LePage, and there is blood on them. And um, through that hemochromogen crystal test, knowing that it was blood, but the, the component missing, of course, is that it was the victim's blood. In truth, most of what passed for damning evidence during this 1876 trial can be explained away, or at least significantly undermined, by today's standards of forensic science. Sure, it was probably blood on his clothes, but to say it was anything beyond mammalian would have been a stretch back then. And who's to say when it was actually deposited on the clothes? Most people back then would have had good reason to have blood on their clothing. People routinely butchered farm animals themselves. Perhaps they got hurt while working. And if they were poor, maybe they only had one set of clothes. And maybe they lacked the facilities to clean their clothes properly. And all that eyewitness testimony, both the prosecution and defense relied so heavily upon, essentially ended up canceling each other out. These people swear they saw him in the area of the crime on the day in question. These people swear he was far away at the time. And of course, today we understand that eyewitness testimony is terribly inaccurate. Emotion and prejudice from both sides likely encouraged witnesses to become much more confident in their testimony they gave at trial. And we need only look at the accusation that almost got William Drew and Charles Moody lynched. An eyewitness who later admitted to lying about an encounter with Drew because she didn't like him. And maybe LePage's boots really did match the marks found on Josie's cheek, but how many other people's boots in town would it have matched? Still, after dispatching with some of the more questionable evidence used to convict LePage, there are two immutable things about the situation that can't be explained away so easily. First, LePage himself admitted that on the day of the murder, there was a significant portion of his day where he was lost in the woods. He saw no one, and no one else saw him. It seems strange for a man used to working in the woods his whole life, to become lost on that particular day, providing no accountability other than his word. And perhaps the most damning and least admissible were LePage's prior arrests and accusations. How likely was it, especially in the 1870s, that more than one man could be connected to so many similar and outrageously brutal crimes in one region, each with connections to the Quebecois community? As with most elements in this case, the investigation, trial, and verdict were dispatched quickly. Josie was found dead on October 4, 1875. 
LePage was arrested 10 days later on October 14th, and his first trial began in January of 1876. The verdict was delivered to a courtroom full of people, including James and Sarah Langmaid, who were reported to be visibly shaking. In March of 1876, LePage was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to hang. This verdict was eventually overturned on appeal, as it was determined that the testimony of Juliana Rousse, LePage's sister-in-law, who accused him of a vicious assault and rape, was deemed inadmissible. This led to a new trial being granted in January of 1877, and by March, he was again found guilty and sentenced to hang, which was carried out in March of 1878 at the state prison in Concord, New Hampshire. In those crime shows we love so much, they always say, you hear about things like this, but you never think it'll happen to you. But people 140 years ago had never heard of things like this, let alone even contemplating whether or not they would happen to them. What that must have done to them all. Her father, her stepmother, her little sisters, her brother who didn't wait for her, the friend who was supposed to show but didn't, the people who found her, the doctors who saw what had happened to her body, her classmates who had to look at her empty chair every day. The guilt, the fear, the shame, the anger, seared into the history of two communities, the one from which Josie came, and that of the expat Québécois LePage lived among and ultimately hid behind. LePage was a sociopath and knew how to manipulate the situation to his benefit. He used the very real bigotry perpetrated by the larger community upon his people to marshal his fellow Quebecois to his defense, a ploy they came to understand better with the passage of time. Because time is a tool we humans use to make sense of things from a safe distance. And in the decades after Josie's murder, the citizens of Pembroke, the Quebecois living in the region, and the Langmaid family would each find themselves dealing with the legacy of this crime in very different ways. This has been The Secret Life of Death, Episode 4, Langmaid, Part 2. Special thanks for this episode go to Jennifer Vanell and Badger Studios for musical performance and arrangement. Adam Gearhart, Lab Procedure Consultant. The Middlebury College Special Collections, Flanders Ballad Collection, for the use of the original recordings of Mabel Wilson Tatro. And thanks to Denver Percussion, Denver, Colorado. For more information about this show, go to our website at thesecretlifeofdeath.com. And for weekly extras and fun photos, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Enjoy this show on any of these podcast platforms. Apple Podcast, Google Play, Stitcher, and Radio Public.